Hi, my name's Simon. Um, tonight's talk's called um, DevOps at a Startup Bank. I'm Simon VC on Twitter. Um, if you want to send me abuse or um, feedback, um, I know none of you are going to tweet because none of you are connected to the Wi-Fi. Yes. Um, tonight we're going to talk about why we're building a new bank when there's already several perfectly good ones out there that you can choose from. Um, we can talk about DevOps because it's a DevOps conference. We can talk about security because it's cool. Uh, and then we're going to take questions because they're always the most interesting thing um, when you do these talks. Um, so what do these numbers mean? Does anyone know? Come on. Yes, exactly. These are the years the big four banks were founded in the UK. Um, it's quite astounding. Like every time people see this slide, they're like, whoa, what? Um, so pivoting straight into technology, <laughs> hands up. <laughs> hands up if you would prefer if you prefer XML to JSON. Get out. Uh, so XML and JSON are extensible um, serialization file formats. They're ways you can take business logic or you know, state about the world and encode them in a file format uh, that they can be serialized along uh, and passed between computer and computer. This is an MT103 message. Uh, XML dates from 1998. Uh, JSON dates from, I think, 2004, 2005. This dates from 1970. Um, it's also a extendable um, serialization format. It's different to XML in that it's terrible. Um, this, like, colon 2.0 is a tag. So you've got uh, colon 2.0, colon 2.3b. Um, it's extensible in the, in the sense that if you're a bank uh, and you can convince other banks that you're going to add some more cruft to the cruft, then they will support your cruft uh, and it becomes extended. Um, a typical bank, one of the big legacy banks right now, um, the process is basically built around these MT103 messages plus another format, uh, ISO 8583, which is even worse, uh, stored in EBCDIC format. Um, who knows what EBCDIC is? Cool. Right, so for those of you who don't, you're probably under, you're probably millennials. Uh, <laughs> and we'd like to have you as a customer. EBCDIC is uh, like, like before there was ASCII, when mainframes roamed the earth, EBCDIC was how they encoded, uh, encoded their, uh, encoded, you know, data. It's like instead of using the eight bits to store a range of characters, you used eight bits um, to store less characters. Uh, it's why old timers still type in capital letters. Um, a lot of the code in the uh, existing banks is written in COBOL. Um, instead of using uh, APIs or service-oriented architecture internally, they probably shift files around. Um, a really common pattern to see is mainframes that pretend to speak FTP. So you actually talk to them and you're like downloading files or uploading files, um, but in reality you're talking to a mainframe. And a lot of stuff is sort of deferred or scheduled by batch processing, so you'll have very important batches like the start of day batch and the end of day batch. Um, these are the things that if they, if they break, nobody gets paid or nobody gets their payroll. And the process dates from the sort of 1970s and hasn't changed much from when computers looked like this. This is an IBM System 360. They still make these. They now come in black. Um, this has a real effect on you, like every day. If you've ever, ever wondered why you can't search your transactions on your web bank, or why you get these weird truncations at 18 characters and everything appears in uppercase on your statement, if you've ever wondered why you can't download your data, it's because a lot of these banks actually only keep three months of data in the mainframe, and then they archive it to tape, and what they actually store is just PDF renderings of the statements that they posted to you. So if you go ask them for your statement four months ago, you can probably download the PDFs, but you probably can't get access to the raw data. Uh, London Hackspace actually has had to build PDF parses so they can download their old data and turn it back into something sensible. Uh, and the reason they don't have an API for a lot of them is because it's not really clear how you build an API on top of a batch process. Uh, and of course, no Unicode characters. They haven't even moved from EBCDIC to ASCII, and I don't think any of them have any plans to do so. So if, you, if your name has any special characters that don't fit into the uh, 26 characters of the English language circa 1970, you are not going to be able to represent your name correctly. Uh, and of course, um, it has an effect on reliability as well. Three of the four major banks have had customer affecting outages this year, and we're only on the 27th of January. Um, one of them is, I'm not going to name names, but you can look it up. One of them is going to result in the CEO of that bank being called to uh, appear before Parliament, which I'm sure he's really looking forward to. Um, IBM tweeted this uh, December last year. It made me really laugh. I think IBM already knows how to convert EBCDIC into ASCII. I think the purpose of this tweet was to try and find people who are willing to consider a career in computational archaeology. 
Um, so that's why we've decided to start a new bank from scratch. Um, based on the principle that user experience is more than just a flashy iPhone app, but it really extends all the way down into the back-end process and the sort of um, user journeys that that uh, enables. Um, built on like really beautiful, uh, beautiful um, user experience, um, modern technology, real-time everything, uh, and the ability to sort of you know deeply integrate your data with your life and your, your financial well-being. Um, we're also um, targeting developers like you guys, so. Um, like you've seen sort of logging with Twitter or logging with Facebook or logging with GitHub. That's called OAuth 2 and particularly it's the three-legged uh, flow of OAuth 2. Um, it's where you can sort of assert your identity to a third party that can then go and get some access from the organization like Facebook, Twitter, Google, Mondo, um, so on and so forth. Uh, and then use that to do interesting things. This is the first uh, integration we released on the weekend at Zapier. Who knows Zap Zapier? Okay, so Zapier for the rest of you is like, if this, then that. You can do amazing things. Um, you literally just like plug one API-based service into another API-based service. You can do, as in this example, you can say, whenever a new transaction comes in from Mondo, um, you can automatically have it added to a Google spreadsheet. So that's your, um, that's your monthly expenses done. Or you could do something like tweet whenever I buy beer in dry January. Um, <clears throat> this is live right now. If you sign up for a Mondo card, you can literally do all of these things with no code. Zapier has 500 integrations. You, like, whatever you imagine you would like to do with a bank account, you can do with literally zero lines of code using Zapier. It's awesome. Um, this is the, uh, the OAuth uh, flow. This is what you would see if you were using an application that was linked into Mondo. Um, I'm hoping many people will here work for organizations that will link directly with Mondo. Uh, in a few years' time, it would be amazing to see, you know, like, like log in with Mondo on all sorts of things uh, in the UK. So this is our developer console. Um, as soon as you get a, uh, a Mondo account, you can basically go to developers.getmondo.co.uk. Um, you don't have to apply to be a developer or anything like that. You literally just go here, you log in, um, and then you can poke our API, you can get your transactions out, um, you can do basically everything you'd expect. Um, so how does all this work? This is our stack. Um, we built all of this in Golang. Hands up here who knows Golang. Awesome, cool. That's changed in the last 12 months a lot. Um, we're we, we're um, following the microservices uh, architecture, like everybody, uh, or as we call them, artisanal nano services. Um, we're building on top of Mesos and Marathon, um, and I'll talk a lot about that in a second. Um, we use Cassandra as our data store, um, which is quite cool. And we use RabbitMQ as our sort of inter-process message bus. Uh, and because it's a DevOps conference, we uh, deploy everything using Ansible. Um, but we don't use Ansible for configuration management. We literally just use it to put bytes on a disk. Um, so this is what Marathon looks like, for those of you who haven't seen it. Um, it's pretty. It has a RESTful API. Um, if you work in computer security, uh, the best or slash worst kind of vulnerability to discover is a remote code execution vulnerability. That's where a, uh, an attacker or a user has found a way to connect to a computer system and uh, cause it to execute arbitrary code, right? A remote code execution vulnerability. That's also a completely accurate description for Marathon. Um, it's, it is remote code execution as a service. Um, has a lovely RESTful API. Um, this is our Marathon. This is our production Marathon, except it actually looks like this. Uh, this is actually half of our services. I couldn't get it to zoom out further. Um, it's even more impressive when you realize that each one of these services is running six instances as well. So we've already built um, something that uh, is massively over-engineered, but it works really well, um, and it's very reliable. Um, another way of looking at those services is this. This is a connection map. Um, so what we're trying to build is uh, different to a lot of uh, applications that you might work on. It's, uh, we're trying to build a distributed system. Um, that means a lot of different things to a lot of um, people, but for us, it means we're architecting toward having no single point of failure. So every time we make a decision about something that we're building or something that we're putting in, we make sure that we can have uh, multiple of them in multiple regions and multiple zones, and no single thing can fail and take, uh, take us out. Um, it means that when we choose products, we make sure that if they have like a, a master and a minion, so they're not completely um, homogenous, uh, it, like Cassandra is completely homogenous, right? Like there is no Cassandra master. All Cassandra nodes are equal. Same for React. Um, but some things like Zookeeper and things like Postgres, uh, they do have a master and a slave, and you can only have one master at a time. But we make sure we choose um, things 
where the uh, you don't have to have any manual input to do leader uh, to promote a slave to a master, which means we're not using things like Postgres, but we are using things like Zookeeper because Zookeeper can do automatic leader election. Um, we're choosing services that can be auto, auto scalable and auto clustering. So we really like things where you don't have to shut down the cluster to add a new node, where you can just like add a, a server. Um, and Mesos and Marathon and Cassandra uh, and Rabbit all fall into that category. Um, and wherever we do persist state, we think really, really hard about whether we want to choose um, consistency or availability in, an, in the event of a network partition. So for some things, like you have to make sure that um, you have to make sure that you can only have one of a thing. Like you don't want to allow double spending. You don't want to have somebody uh, accidentally spending money and then being able to spend it again. That would be bad in a bank. So we would choose um, consistency. Uh, and in some things, like if we're getting the, the logo of a merchant that you might have looked at, we don't care if we give you the absolute up-to-date one or if in the event of a network partition, we give you a slightly older one. So we would choose an available um, partition tolerant database um, like Cassandra. So we're very aware of that. So that, that sort of like um, informs our decisions about how we do our architecture. Um, the other thing that makes us um, really different to uh, a lot of the places that I've worked is lots of vertical integration. So if you haven't heard the term vertical integration before, um, a really good example is companies like Apple, Tesla, and uh, SpaceX. And the idea is instead of like, like, so let me give you an example. If you work at like a typical, I don't know, Java shop, you'll have a bunch of um, developers and they will write code, and then they might just give you the code, and then your job as DevOps people is to package that into a war file, deploy it onto a server, make sure it gets started when the box gets rebooted, make sure that the, the logs that it outputs are centralized somewhere, make sure that it's monitored, make sure that it's restarted if it crashes, um, make sure its configuration files are in the right place thanks to Chef or Puppet. Like All of that stuff is sort of extraneous to the, the, the role of the developers. Um, with the, the, uh, the way we're building Mondo, um, we, all of that stuff is important, and all of that stuff is a first-class uh, requirement for what we're building. So we have things like a logging service. We have things like a tracing service. Uh, and service discovery and configuration management is right there. We have services for those things. Um, the effect on the, as a DevOps person is that I have very little work to do when I build a new environment. Uh, I literally pass one environment variable to my Ansible scripts, and that is like the environment that I'm building. I literally tell it whether it's production or staging, and that doesn't have any effect. It literally just changes the host names. Everything else is the services, all they do is they boot up, and they connect to the RabbitMQ proxy that's running on the local host, and they basically say, hi, where's my configuration service? Um, so a lot more vertical integration than, than uh, a, lot of other, um, a lot of other sites that I've worked. And soon, hopefully, we'll do deployment as well. If you think of an application uh, that manages its own life cycle, um, it's really nice when Firefox sort of downloads an upgrade to Firefox in the background and then says, hey, there's a new Firefox. Do you want to restart now or next time you start Firefox, right? That's basically what we'd like to get to as well. So the application is aware of its own life cycle um, and is able to update itself without us having to, to tell Marathon to do that. So. <clears throat> this is what a, a typical, um, a very, very, very simplified web sequence diagram for a transaction looks like. Um, and uh, if you think about each one of these services, uh, they could be like, for each one of these services, um, and this is a very simplified diagram, um, there would be six at least instances of these services running across sort of dozens of machines, maybe 20 or 30 machines. Uh, and so it can be very, very difficult to find out uh, the log file to look at when something goes wrong. In fact, it's impossible. Um, so what we've done is we've got this thing called structured logging. And what that does is um, any time a service, uh, basically all services create or pass a, tra a trace ID. So anytime you see a problem in any log file or any, any output or in any you know, um, sentry or email or anything, you can grab that trace ID and you can come to this structured logging tool that, uh, that we've built and you can actually find that trace ID throughout all the stack. So you can see like this is where the request came in through the API and this is like all of the different services it talked to and that's all centralized um, through the, uh, the structured logging service or the slog service. Um, and it's brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. It's one of those things that um, you wouldn't see in a, in a typical uh, application. Um, you might, like as DevOps people, be asked to install Elk or the Elasticsearch. Um, and if you are, I'm sorry. Uh, it's horrible. Um, the other thing is we have really beautiful tooling because everything is a first class uh, consumer of our API. There's no, like, there's no um, BizOps server. 
Um, there's a Twitter bootstrap uh, and React.js uh, front end that can talk to the API, that can let you do things. Um, literally everything from the iPhone app that we already have to um, all of our uh, BizOps tooling, all of our, um, like everything is basically a, a consumer of the same API. So with this, um, the service uh, discovery and config discovery, um, traditionally I think you would use something like Puppet or Chef to actually maintain configuration files on a box. Um, we've uh, sort of done away with that. Um, there isn't really any configuration on the machines anymore, um, except for maybe Cassandra. Uh, and, and then some things require bootstrapping, like we have to boot them up and tell them like, you know, uh, where the initial machines are so we can start the cluster running. But apart from bootstrapping, there's not really any configuration anymore. Um, so we don't have to do things like uh, have a configuration tool, manage that configuration. Um, it's pretty much, uh, if, if uh, a service boots up, if it, as long as it can talk to the RabbitMQ and there's a proxy on every box, uh, then it can basically find its configuration. Um, we have this amazing um, command line tool called the CLI, um, not a great name, uh, but it's, uh, it, it uses the service discovery, um, the service discovery service to allow you to dynamically build up sort of a tab completable um, CLI on the, uh, on the API. So you can, anything you can do on our, uh, on our, um, on our, uh, on our API, you can uh, sort of explore with the CLI. And I know we kind of stole that from, uh, from Ravelin. <laughs> Um, so Golang, I know a lot of you guys have already used it, um, but if you haven't, here's my takeaways from uh, my year of uh, using Golang. Uh, I uh, had never used Go before. Um, it's really easy to learn. If you've written anything in Python before or Ruby, um, it's slightly less, uh, it's slightly less, I feel slightly less productive. I can't get so much done in a really short amount of time. But when I have to read either the code that I've written before or somebody else's code, um, it's certainly much easier. And I think for teams, it obviously um, scales a lot better. Um, it's really easy to deploy. Like I am just so happy to never have to worry about dependency isolation or um, pip and gems and npm before. You just you run a you run a build process. You get an 11 meg binary. You chuck that in S3, and when you want to run that program, you download it from S3 and run it. Um, no more class path issues. No more 1.4 gigabyte jar files. Um, and a few people have have noticed this. Um, a lot of what we do as DevOps people is we will take tools that do the thing that we want to do, and we will package them, and we'll put them on a box, and then we'll write some glue code, usually bash script, around them. Uh, and in, a, in the, Dev in the uh, Golang ecosystem, we're much less likely to do that. I find what I do is I find a library that does what I want to do. Like I might go find the Go Marathon library to talk to Marathon, or, or something else, or the Zookeeper library to talk to Zookeeper. And I'll actually build a tool that does just what I want uh, by using those libraries. Um, and the end result is um, better code, um, Less, uh, less spaghetti code, less glue code, um, and the results um, is quite, uh, quite nice. Cool. So everybody always asks about security. They always say, like, is, it, uh, is, doing, is working at a bank mean you spend more time uh, doing security than you would on another organization? Uh, and the answer is yes and no. <clears throat> um, yes, everybody should do more security, but no, I don't think banks have any particularly high level of security requirement, not compared to like just about everything uh, we do as DevOps people. As DevOps people, we're always in an incredibly privileged position. We're at the point where configuration and code sort of meet, usually in production, and that means we all have access to AWS keys and SSH keys and database passwords. Like that's what we do as a job. So um, like the world has, <laughs> like we've kind of, like the world isn't doing a good job of computer security. Um, and it's not enough anymore to have a security guy working at your company whose job it is to go around telling people to, oh, please be secure. That doesn't work. Like, that is a failed model. Like, your job is security. Every developer's job is security, but you guys more than the developers because you're the ones who have that privileged access. So you need to stop thinking about yourselves as DevOps guys and start thinking of yourselves as, like, DevSecOps guys. Um, if you don't have a password manager, you should be using a password manager. You should be using multi-factor authentication. You should be learning to, to communicate secrets securely. Like, I get really angry when people send AWS keys through Slack. <laughs> Seriously. It, everybody does it. It makes me really angry. Um, we play a game at Mondo, which is uh, called the N-Cage game, the Nicolas Cage game. You guys played this? So what it is, if anybody leaves their machine unlocked, everyone else has the right to install the Nicolas Cage plugin on their Chrome that replaces all of their images with Nicolas Cage. 
Uh, and we, we play this religiously. Everybody gets done. Most people get done once a week. And after about three months, nobody, like, people, you see people, they get up and they walk, they walk over to the coffee machine like this. And they get their coffee and they walk back. Um, and it, but it, it means that we are way more uh, aware of uh, computer security. It's a really good game. You guys should play it. Um, hands up if you use SSH on a daily basis. Everyone. Hands up if you keep your SSH on your computer. Yeah, don't keep, like, YubiKeys are amazing. What a YubiKey is, is a YubiKey is a tiny little hardware security module that means if hackers have already hacked into your computer, and let's face it, they probably have, especially if you're using a Windows machine. If hackers have hacked into your computer, they can't just take your SSH key. Because when they take your SSH key, you don't know. You don't know that they now have the SSH key that's going to let them, like, commit code to Git. It's going to let them log into your servers. Um, so YubiKeys are really, really good. Um, they cost 41 bucks. Don't, do, don't have one person in your team get a YubiKey. Put a stake in the ground and say, like, as of 3 o'clock on Thursday, everybody is going to use a YubiKey. Everybody is going to replace their SSH keys with YubiKeys. Sit down as a team. Do it as a team. It works really well. Get the small one. Half, the, half of it's got the small one. Half of it's got the big one. The big one breaks. The small one's great. It's really good. So get a YubiKey. Um, this is um, my laptop. I, um, I wanted to show you guys this. I don't know. How, who here uses Ansible? OK, so this is just for the Ansible guys, right? So up here, you can see I'm doing an Ansible run. I'm actually pushing out to production. Um, I'm SSHing from my laptop into a Bastion host with SSH agent forwarding. And then from there, I'm running Ansible, talking out to like literally dozens of machines. You can see down here, my YubiKey is flashing. So there are boxes in the AWS cloud that are being updated. They're having their, their like these are, these are like, this is our production cluster. This is a future bank's production cluster. And the ability for me to make changes to that box is tied to that little, that little LED. Like, this, like, I love this thing. I love it so much. If I suspected that I had been hacked, or if I suspected that somebody in my team um, was doing something they shouldn't be, I could literally pull that out, and then I don't have the ability to access that box anymore. There's nothing in my head that gets me access to those boxes. I don't know any passwords. I don't you know, have any privileged knowledge. What I have is a YubiKey. So seriously, you should um, think about doing YubiKeys. Um, if, you don't, if you remember one thing from this whole talk, um, apart from how awesome I am, it's um, Google, Trammel, Hudson, YubiKey. It explains really easily how to do this. Um, and as a bonus, once everybody in your team has a YubiKey, the way YubiKey actually does SSH is it does it using GPG the GNU Privacy Guard, aka PGP. Um, once you have uh, a YubiKey in your computer, these commands will work, right? You'll be able to do list keys. You'll be able to see your key. You can do GPG send keys, and it'll send it up to the key server. You can do GPG search keys. You can get somebody else's key. You can do GPG receive keys. You can download your colleague's key. And you can do GPG ear, minus E-A-R. Just remember the ear. Um, and what it'll have is it will um, pop up a window where you can type a secret and you hit Control D and it gives you a block of encrypted text. Okay? Then you take that encrypted text, you paste it into Slack. They take the encrypted test, text and they paste it into GBG and they get the decrypted text. And Slack doesn't archive that forever and ever and ever and eventually leak it. Um, so you get GPG for free um, when you use YubiKeys. That's all I have um, prepared. Um, questions are way more interesting. Um, I should mention, like, can I ask a question? Who here has heard of Mondo before today? Wow, I love you guys. And who's already got a Mondo card? And, and what do you think of it? Wonderful. Awesome. OK, um, please don't all mob me. I have 24 more oh, YubiKeys. Oh, sorry. Uh, carry on. Oh, no, I'm done. I'm basically done. And this guy tells me to get off. I have 24 more Mondo cards. Um, come see me afterwards. Okay, cool. Sorry, do we have time for questions? No. Uh -huh. <laughs> no, sorry, guys. But catch him afterwards. Ask questions, obviously.